testing. Okay, good. All right, let's get started. Welcome to CS uh, 3510. Uh, the topic of today is something called linear programming, LP. Programming in this regard is an old word. Uh, today you know programming is when you write code. Um, it's a different activity than computer science, but it's you, you're still doing things. You're writing instructions or something. Linear program, the word programming used to mean like planning. Like I have a big piece of paper in front of me and I'm figuring out where the road is supposed to go. You know, it, that's what programming used to mean. Linear programming, as we'll see today, is about linear systems of inequalities. Uh, a linear program is, uh, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see it today, but it's basically, uh, a problem uh, about a system of linear inequalities, and you maybe should recall a few basic things about linear algebra uh, today. Uh, the simplex algorithm is an algorithm which solves a linear program. We won't be able to do a full calculation of the simplex algorithm today. It's kind of tedious with pen and paper, but there's great high level uh, in intuition about how it works, which is what we'll try to communicate today. So a linear program, um, so a lot of problems, like practical problems, uh, can be phrased as linear problems. Like if you're in the ISYDE department, there's an entire course, there's an entire sequence you can take on just linear programming. Uh, I think I, I took a linear programming course when I was like a third year, and it was just on linear programming. Um, so just know that although that we're doing just two lectures on this topic, you can have, you could go do a PhD on this if you wanted. People are still working on this. Um, so linear program, let's say you're, uh, you're a guy who sells things and you can sell uh, item one sells uh, for one dollar and item two sells for six dollars, okay? So you want to sell items, you can, you're going to be a guy who produces items one and items two, and item one sells for one dollar and item two sells for six dollars. Let's say uh, you can make, uh, can make no more than uh, 600 items a day, and um, just by the resource that you uh, uh, have, you can't uh, make more than um, uh, 200 uh, item ones and uh, 300 item two. The problem is word is you can't produce more than this due to sanctions. Um, so here we have a, a, a problem, and usually it's, if it's given to you as a word problem, first you have to convert it into something that we'll say looks like a linear program. So you're this uh, cartoonishly evil factory boss and you want to sell, you want to maximize profit. And you know that there's a trade-off uh, between these two items. So n normally you may, if you're you know, a business major, you see this problem and you're like, I'm going to sell as much of item two as I can and I'm not even gonna bother selling any of item one. Uh, but the problem is slightly more, it's uh, slightly more difficult than that because although you can make 600 items a day, you can't make more than 300 of item twos. So if you make too much of item two, you still have capacity left over to produce, but uh, what you can't just sit there and not produce those items, right? The goal for this is always to maximize or minimize something, yes. Um, I think that'll end up being the solution, yeah. Um, my bad, 600, 400, okay. Problem's interesting now, okay. Um, so we can represent, although this is a word problem, this is a really practical problem. This is how everything works. Um, again, if you're an ISYE major, you just stare at this kind of thing all day and they hire you to figure out how to plan a, factory um, uh, floor, we can represent this as a system of linear uh, inequalities, okay? So you, we're gonna maximize what's called the objective function. 
The objective function, every linear program is going to have an objective function, it's going to have a system of linear inequalities. The objective function here is going to be we want to maximize the amount of profit. And if item one sells for $1 and item two sells for $6, we want to maximize x1 plus 6x2. We'll let x1 and x2 represent the, the amount of item one we produce and the amount of item two that we produce. Well, suddenly you have a word problem and you introduce letters, suddenly you can apply uh, mathematics. So we can represent the other constraints on the problem through variables x1 and x2. So what you then say is you say subject to uh, a system of linear inequalities, you can make no more uh, than 400 items a day. So you know that x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 400, right? You know that um, you can't make more than 200 item ones, so you know that 200 Oh, excuse me. You know that uh, x1 is less than 200. And you know that x2 is less than 300. And you also know that you can't make negative amounts of items. So you know that x1, x2 is uh, greater than or equal to 0. Right? Yes. Well, uh, if that is an optimal strategy, how do you prove it's optimal? Let's suppose you try, let's say you don't know anything about linear programming yet, and we don't because it's the first five minutes of class. You give an algorithm, you're just going to try and maximize x2, and then whatever's left over, you're going to try and do x1. That is a greedy algorithm, and that sounds, for such a simple problem with only two variables, actually that might work. But how would you prove that there's no more optimal of a solution? Maybe if you make 50 less item ones, you can make 300 more item twos. I mean, 50 less item twos, you make 50, uh, 300 more item ones. Something like this, yeah? Um, we'll talk about NAPTEC later today. And although you're seeing sums of linear equalities, it's uh, a generalization of NAPTEC. In fact, it's not only a generalization of NAPTEC, we'll see later today, this is a generalization of maxwell min cut. So many things are just linear programs. It's, it's sometimes, so many times I've just been like reading a practical problem, something mm, that doesn't sound like it would have anything to do with linear programming, like edge computing or something, and I'm like, oh, that's, you're just doing a linear program. So, so many problems can be phrased as linear programs, as we'll see today, including NAPSAC problems and Maxwell problems. Um, the NAPSAC algorithm, how would that work here? Well, NAPSAC, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that one. Let's talk about that one later. So, again, how do you uh, solve this? So, in fact, before we, before we talk about this, let's represent this uh, more generally. So we're con we have uh, a matrix and two vectors. Immediately we're going from, in linear algebra, you stop talking about linear equations, you immediately start talking about matrices. We have a matrix here, A, of values, let's call it uh, 1, 0, uh, 0, 1, and then 1, 1. And we have a matrix B of values uh, 200, 300, and 400. And then we have a, a, a matrix C, excuse me, a vector C of values 1, 6. And the question is uh, to find, find a vector X uh, such that um, the, you're trying to maximize C the transpose of Cx subject to Ax is less than or equal to b. So this is what's called standard form of a uh, linear program. Notice that we have e each linear inequality is a constraint, and we have a set of constraints, and we express this as a, as a matrix. Uh, would you, uh, are you convinced that this uh, set of matrices and vectors is a, the exact problem here? Again, if you have x1, x2, x3 here, uh, excuse me, not x1, x2, x, uh, x3, x1, x2, you flip it, you get x1 must be less than or equal to 200, x2 must be less than or equal to 300, and then x1 plus x2 must be less than or equal to 400, which is what our constraints are. Um, similarly, CT transpose, you take the transpose of C as a vector just so you can multiply it with an, as a dot product with another vector, right? Question? No? Okay. Um, 
So this is called standard form. And these two are technically constraints, but they're not put in there. And the reason is that when a matrix is in standard form, you need to just suppose that x1 and x2 are all positive. You can just suppose that they're all non-negative. If, if it's in something that's called standard form. If it's not in standard form, notice that this is uh, a less than or equals to, and these are all greater than or equals to. But you should know from some elementary algebra, given a linear program, perhaps not in standard form, you can just do a little bit of trickery and you can get it into standard form. How, if I, let's suppose we required x1, x2 to be somehow a row of our, of our uh, a, how would we put that so that we could still write ax less than or equal to b here? So we want to have the constraint this way, but we want to write it as a linear, uh, a linear combination less than or equal to something. Yes. Yeah, multiply by negative one on both sides. Uh, x1 is greater than or equal to zero if and only if. A negative x1 is less than or equal to zero. So what you do there is you just have a negative one in your A matrix, and then congrats, you flipped it around and put it in standard form. Does it communicate? Less information, kind of, because you can visualize these, these being positive rather than visualizing these being not negative. But uh, that allows you to put it in standard form. So it's, it's, and oftentimes we just assume that x1, x2 are positive. But you get to, uh, great thing is, um, once you put it in standard form, you get to apply all the algorithms because the algorithms assume that the problem is in standard form. Can't, questions on this so far? So a lot of algorithms uh, don't have great geometric intuition and interpretation. The simplex algorithm and linear programs in general are an exception to that. So basically, if you have a set of lines, uh, what is a linear inequality if not a line in the plane? Okay, pretend instead of x1, x2, it was like y equals mx plus b. That x1 uh, plus x2, let's suppose, let's think about the less than equals part later, but x1 plus x2 equals 400 is a line in the plane. You could plot that. So let's suppose we plotted the following lines. I didn't bring my giant ruler, but we know, let's suppose we plotted uh, x1 on the bottom and x2 here. We know that x2, x1 has to be less than or equal to 200, right? So what we're gonna do is put a point here of 200 That is a line in the plane that represents x1 must be equal to 200. How do we denote that x1 must be less than or equal to 200? Well, if you take a line in the plane and you specify that it's not equal to the line, but less than equal to the line, you simply denote a side of the line. Would you agree everything on that side satisfies x1 less than or equal to 100, right? In fact, here is x1 and x2 equals 0 and 0. And certainly if x1 and x2 equals 0 and 0, then x1 is less than 200, right? But as you increase x2, it'll be here. Here is just wherever you would put y, right? Uh, excuse me, x2. Then if we do x2, let's say that's 300. That looks about proportional. We can draw uh, another line here. And then in the same way, we know that x2 uh, two must be less than or equal to 300, not exactly equal to 300. You take the inequality, you pretend it's inequality, you draw the dotted line, and then you uh, uh, choose half of it. It partitions the, the plane. So we know everything below this line satisfies that first inequality, uh, excuse me, that second inequality. Everything on the left of this line satisfies the first inequality, right? So if there is a solution to satisfy both of those inequalities, then it has to be in this area. Right? We're not done, we have one more equation, which is that x1 plus x2 must be less than or equal to 400. Now, here's the thing, if you set x1 to be zero, and then we know x2 is 400, maximally, and if you set x2 to be zero, then we know x1 is 400. So what I'm gonna do is just do like, that's 400, 300, this is 400, you agree? So maximally, if you take this, this one, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 400, 
x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 400, then if you set x1 to be 0, x2 must be 400. If you set x2 to be 0, x1 must be 400. So we know that it intersects there. So what I'm going to do is just kind of do this. Okay. Let me uh, double bold it so we see what our quote unquote feasible region is. It'd be so good if I figured out how to use a computer with slides. Okay, this is called the feasible region. Also, we have a border here. Why? Because x1 and x2 must be greater than or equal to zero, so we're only in the first quadrant. So we have, look at, we look, look at that, the, uh, we have five constraints, and look at that, they plotted five sides of a polygon. The fact that x1 must be greater than or equal to zero is this line, x2 must be greater than or equal to zero is this line, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 400 is this line, x1 can't be greater than 200 is that line, x2 can't be greater than 300 is that line, okay? We have a polygon in the plane. Now, any point within this polygon is a valid solution to the linear program. It's a solution. First, we're going to concern ourselves with a solution, then we're going to concern ourselves with what is the maximal solution. So thankfully, our objective function is also uh, linear. There's no squares or cube roots in it or anything weird. You know, you're not taking derivatives and divisions. You just have a, uh, a linear combination of constants and variables. So you can, uh, but you, you have x1 plus 6x2. You can't plot this because you don't know, you know, like y equals mx plus b. You don't know what the b is. The b would correspond to where it exists on the thing. But it does denote a slope still. You don't have the b, but you do have the slope, right? So what you should think about is y equals mx plus b here, this objective function, is a line. Um, and wherever that line intersects the, f uh, you want, you're concerned with where does that line intersect my polygon in the maximal place, right? Maybe it's a decreasing line, maybe it's an increasing line, whatever. But you can think of your objective function, here's a, maybe a not so clear analogy. Think of it like a gravity, think of it like a, a force field, a vector field over your, whatever your polygon is, and you're just trying to maximize with respect to that objective function, right? Now, I can't actually plot it because I don't know where it is, but you can imagine a line that you're choosing the b for, and whatever that b is, is maximal. Um, you want to maximize b. So immediately, we, what do we think the solution, so uh, any, any solution to the linear program is going to be inside this polygon. Where do we think the maximal solution is going to be, not just for this polygon, but for any polygon? It's going to be on the border, right? Um, here's sort of the reason. If you have a point here and uh, your objective function is linear, then maybe you move towards wherever the objective function is telling you to move towards. If you have an interior point, well, that's not maximal because there's a, you just follow the objective function to a, mac a more maximal value. If you're on the border, you can't increase your maximal value. Um, there's going to be a lot of deep, although pictorially that makes sense, there's a lot of deep linear algebra for that, why that's true. Uh, we know it's going to be on the border, but we know more specifically where it's going to be on the border. There's a lot of, there's actually infinitely many points on the border, right? If we suppose, here the problem is worded as x1 and x2 are a number of items, they must be integers. But in fact, suppose they're real numbers, okay? Uh, wh where do we think x, this maximal solution is going to be? On this line? Where on that line? Think about a more general linear program rather than this specific one, right? You're given a, a polygon, you're maximizing with respect to a linear function. Where should a solution lie? Yes? A uh, corner solution? The, what I'll say is a point. So basically, the objective function is going to be on the border. So we know it's on the border. Intuitively, we know it's on the border. We haven't proved it's on the border. But we know it's on the border, OK? Now, where on the border, there's lines and there's points, OK? So uh, if, is it on a line or is it on a point? It's on a point. Uh, why? Suppose it was on a line. What do you know about a linear system of equations? If it's on a line, uh, you choose a different point on the line, it still satisfies the linear inequality of that constraint. So those should still be two solutions. Now, if, this, if you have two points on a line and both are equal, 
then you know that the slope of that line is exactly equal to the slope of your objective function. So your objective function is actually the same as a constraint. So every point on the line is the same, though, because when you have a linear equa equation like that, that th satisfies an infinite set of points, that, that, all, that all satisfy the, uh, the equality. But if, if you have two points on a line and one is greater than the other, let's say this one is greater than the other, then what you can do is choo go that way, but be because everything's linear, you can actually just go here, and you'll be stuck at a corner. So the only time a point on a line is maximal is if every point on the line is maximal, but including the two points that are the end of that line segment. Question? It, it would be literally like the x1 and x2 you plug into here. Not necessarily, not necessarily. As we'll see, there's minimizations. Sometimes maybe you want to minimize something. Maybe you have a weird shape. We just know for now that it's on the border. And it depends on what the objective function is. What if instead of x1 plus x2, it was x1 plus 100 x2, right? Or like 1,000 x1 plus x2, uh, you know, something like this. That'll change where it is. Think of the objective function, and maybe this is not the clearest analogy when I'm drawing things in a bar, I don't have fancy Vsauce level animation, but think of it as gravity, okay? And you're gonna be pointed, gravity's pushing you if you're maximizing, gravity's gonna push you up in this case, and you're going to, it's not a many body problem, problem gravity where it's all bendy. Gravity, think of gravity in this case as linear, you're gonna fall up and you're gonna fall exactly at one of the points that's gonna be maximal. In the same way when you drop a marble into a bowl, it always sits at the bottom. Think of it the opposite way, you drop the marble up, it's always gonna sit at a point, except it's gonna sit at the, it, it will only sit at the line if gravity is exactly perpendicular to that line, right? I, it's a similar idea there. Um, so this is our analogy, again, any, any point in the feasible region uh, looks like this. Now, we, this is, I think, my favorite part of linear programming is the fact that there's a geometric intuition behind what a problem means. It's a shape, and great things uh, come from when you can look at shapes. And, um, but we can also assert just by the shape when a linear programming, when linear programming doesn't have a solution. So again, given a general system of linear inequalities like this, uh, it's not necessarily true that there is a solution. So let's do two quick geometric uh, arguments here. First, we'll argue when a, a geometric uh, argument in favor of when a linear program does not have a solution. When do you think an LP doesn't have a solution? Um, uh, a point could have area zero. Uh, but basically, yeah, consider the constraints x1 is greater than or equal to one, and also x1 is less than or equal to negative one, okay? Now, you have to satisfy all the constraints, all of them. Not some of them or most of them, you have to satisfy all of them. Uh, something like that, if we were to draw that as a feasible region, this is not the, the same picture, but like, let's say we had less than or equal to some function here, and then we also required greater than or equal to some other function, something like this. Well, there's, there's no intersection between those feasible regions, so then there's, I mean, there's no solution to this one, right? Uh, so an LP has no solution when the, uh, there is no point that, a single point that satisfies the constraint. You don't get your nice polygon. There's a second way that a uh, linear programming uh, an LP has no uh, solution. Let's see if we can think of it. What is the second case? Not when, not when there's no feasible region. What is the second case when an LP should have no f solution? The pointer? Uh, 
Okay, that's, that's going to end up being the answer, yeah? Ah, see, but the great thing about uh, the fan, and we'll talk about convexity in a second. The great thing about the fact we're doing linear programming and instead of nonlinear programming is I'm not going to draw a parabola. You know what I'm saying? I won't have to. That's, the, that's beautiful in, in my opinion. Uh, to rephrase what you said, it's basically if an LP is unbounded. It's, it's like there's no feasible region or it's unbounded. What does an unbounded LP look like? Max, let's say 2x1, subject to uh, x1 is greater than or equal to 0. So what does that feasible region look like? It's going to, we don't even have an x2, but let's pretend we did just because we can plot two-dimensional things. Um, let's even say x1, let's say x1. We got, you're maximizing that way. The feasible region is unbounded. So there's no solution because the solution is infinite. You know, oh, it just produces as much. Uh, there is no other constraint that says, you know, I can't produce more than this much a day. Uh, you just, practically, if you saw something like this, you would be, you're missing the constraint that limits how much you can produce. So you would just say, I'm gonna produce as much as X1 as possible, right? Something like this. Practically, there may be a, uh, uh, a solution. In LP, there's no solution here, right? Any question on these two, the, the two reasons, the two, the two ways uh, an LP would not have a solution? If the feasible region doesn't intersect and if it's unbounded. Right. Now, here's the great thing about the fact this is linear programming, non-linear programming. Non-linear programming means maybe you have like x1 squared plus 6x2 or something weird. Uh, and the basically, we don't know how to do anything with, when you have non-linear programming. But we, I mean like the theoretical community, just like if, you, if they see this, I mean people are crying. Um, uh, it, the reason for this, uh, analogously, is I, let's say I were to draw functions that are not lines and take the intersection. Maybe I have a parabola. Maybe I have something that looks like this. And then I also have a parabola that looks like this. And let's say I'm trying to minimize this way. So we have something that's not a nice polygon. We have a shape, right? So where does the, where's the maximum here? It's gonna be somewhere on this, satisfying this constraint. But is it here? Or do I have to go this way? and then I go this way, and then I maybe I have to go backwards, right? The max is sort of an angled, um, and the angle would be exactly proportional to the slope of the objective function, but how would I compute what the maximal point is here? What I'm gonna do is forever, I'm just gonna be infinitely trying to get closer and closer to this real number solution, uh, and, I won't, and I won't solve it. Um, there's other reasons that nonlinear program is very difficult in the sense that there's no general ways to solve a lot of these problems. Linear programming, though, does. So we're not going to ever do that, and we're not going to ever think about that. Um, also, by the way, nonlinear programming basically doesn't show up in practice. Like, if you're ever doing something, it's way more common for things to be linear uh, inequalities than it for it to be a nonlinear inequality. If you think about this businessman's analogy about selling items, what would it mean for there to be a square there? Somehow, if you quadra, if you square the number of items produced, something happens. You know, that's not the, somehow he has a deal, like you know, a buy one, sell two, some some some, some sort of deal that someone has promised him pro quadratic profit for something instead of. But profit is always linear, so there's he has, you know what I'm saying? It's 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 contrived, non-trivial. Okay, so we know that the solution to a linear programming, if it uh, defines a, a polytope like this, uh, is going to be at one of the points. Two more quick things about the polytope interpretation. One, it's convex. Do you guys know the definition of a convex body? A body is convex, is, a function is convex, and now there's a formal definition you can take, uh, but basically if you pick any two points in the interior and you define your, your, uh, your metric, the shortest distance between those two points is contained in the object, okay? So this is, this is an example of a convex function. An example that's not convex may be something like this. We would consider this to not be convex because if you pick two points, uh, let me change the camera, you guys gotta see these squiggles. Um, if you pick two points not, that are in the object, the shortest distance between them is not in the object. Okay. So this is not convex. 
That's an intuitive definition. There is a more formal geometric definition of uh, convexity, but it just uh, exists to simulate this intuitive property, right? If I gave you a shape, a closed shape, and I asked you if it was convex, you probably could do it, right? Unbounded shapes may also be convex, right? Consider the area above x squared, convex. Um, why does the intersection of linear inequalities in the plane produce a convex uh, object? Why is the polytope convex? Certainly it is convex, but try to convince yourself you couldn't produce one that was not convex. Okay, yeah? Mm. Uh, well, there's, not, there's no guarantee that a linear program it requires a unique answer because I recall if that the slope of the objective function is equal to one of the, slo one of the slopes of the constraints, then every point on that constraint is gonna be uh, a solution. So like everything, uh, it's best to delegate to mathematical proof. Suppose that uh, there was a non-convex shape. Consider that you had a set of system of linear inequality that was not convex. This is just an example of one, but suppose we had something like this. And let's say you, this was a constraint. Let's say this was a constraint. Uh, this was a constraint. And this was a constraint. Now, uh, if you put a point, if you pick two points, if you choose a solution here, this exists in the not convex part of it. Suppose to the contrary that a system of linear inequalities could not be convex. Let me move the camera again. Um, well, this would be an example that's not convex. You can put two points here and the dotted, well, that's a bad example. And the, and the shortest distance between those two, I know that line is curving, the shortest distance between those two would be outside of the feasible region. Um, we have a problem with this picture. What is it? What's our contradiction? Assume to the contrary, a, an intersection of linear inequalities can form a non-convex polytope. Then if you pick two points that are in this non-convex part, these points must exist. However, this point satisfies this linear inequality, this linear inequality, and this linear inequality, but not this linear inequality. It's outside of this linear inequality. So were I to take the intersection of these linear inequalities, it would never be not convex because the not convex part would actually be rounded off. This would have been the actual convex region. And look at that, that's convex. Contradiction. So the intersection of, poly, uh, the intersection of these linear inequalities will form a uh, polytope, right? Let's, uh, so we understand that the shape is convex and that helps us with our solution, right? But uh, importantly, a con there's a huge body of work on convex optimization and convex analysis and things like this. But the convexity property is really essential for the algorithms to work because for every convex function, you have a, 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 a great guarantee, which is that any local minima is also a global minima. That's a huge thing. Um, you won't ever have a function like this be not convex. So if you're trying to find the minimal of the minima of some function like this, you get the guarantee that if you find a local minima, and a lot of algorithms only know how to find local minima. If you find a local minima, you're great. You found the global mini minima, you stop. Convexity is a great property to have. And non-convex analysis, very difficult. Uh, we don't have really good ways to do any of those problems. You may have seen ways to solve, find global minima of non-convex functions uh, through very, basically, hacks and heuristics. Um, this would never happen in convex analysis. One of the things I've heard you could do is you could do like ran the random restart method. Right, so basically like, okay, I found a local minima, maybe it's local, I randomly restart somewhere else, maybe I find a better local minima. This doesn't guarantee you'll ever reach a global minima, because again, the function is global, it's infinite, the scope is huge, but you're just a tiny little dot, and you're tracing along the line somewhere like this. So convexity gets us the fact that the, the algorithm is just gonna search for a local minima, and by the convexity property that we see here, the intersection of these linear inequalities forms a convex polytope, the, the local minima is the global minima, and we get to stop. That's one of the great reasons linear programming is, uh, will have a reasonable algorithm and uh, I can't even tell you the name of an algorithm that solves a nonlinear programmer, nonlinear non programming. Um, one final mention on the geometry, we spent a lot, a, a more, several minutes on this. We n look at a shape and you say that there's a point. Okay, wow, the solution is a point. But what does the, the point mean if you go back to what the linear 
system of linear inequalities is, okay? There's a, there's a, a geometric int uh, interpretation where you're like, okay, that's a point. But what is, what does it mean for the system of linear inequalities for you to be at a point? What is a point? Everything in the feasible region is a solution. What makes the point special? A maximal solution, sure. Um, so we know that the points are a maximal solution, but what does it mean to be at a point? What is a point? I guess, I guess that's what I'm asking, yeah. I guess that what I'm looking for is that every two lines must intersect in some, some point. So if you are at a point, which is in several, when we do n-dimensional versions of this, uh, it could be the intersections of several n minus one dimensional and analogously planes. If you take two planes and intersect them, they form a line. If you take two lines and you intersect them, they form a point, right? You get the n minus one dimensional object. So if you take two lines and intersect them, you get a point. A point is therefore a solution that is tight for both um, uh, constraints. So if you're at, if you're on a line, you are maximizing that specific constraint, right? If you're on this line here, this specific line here, that means you are at the solutions that require x1 to be equal to 200. So that means the constraint x1 less than equal to 200 is what we would call tight. That means that solution has been maximized. If you're at a, const if you're at a point uh, somewhere else on the polytope, it's the intersection of two lines. So that means two of the linear inequalities are tight. Two or more of the linear inequalities are tight. Maybe in, in dimensions, it may be more, but two of them are tight. The other ones are relaxed, they're slack. But that's, a great other, that's another great point we know. Any, we, can, we can take the geometric interpretation that the point is a solution, we go back to looking at the linear inequality. Any solution to a linear inequality like this, of two variables at least, must have at least two of its constraints tight. Do you see that to be true? If the, if, if the solution exists at a point, then two of the constraints are tight, okay? It, there will never be a maximal solution such that none of the constraints are tight. There's a little bit of gap between any, suppose to the contrary, there is a maximal solution that there's a little bit of gap between every single constraint, okay? Well, that would correspond to a point in the interior of the feasible region. Well, we know that you can always maximize towards the objective function, and you haven't hit a maximal if you're in the interior. You just go towards wherever the objective function tells you, points you towards, and congrats, you're now at the boundary again. And if you hit two boundary, if you hit the, uh, a point, then you have ma you're at the maximal of two linear inequalities. Any questions on that fact? We see we can translate between the geometric inter interpretation, between the linear algebra, and between a system of linear inequalities. Stuff you can say about geometry ha implicates the linear algebra and the inequalities. Things you can say about the inequalities can implicate the geometry, right? You guys, can you work with the, the, all three of those? You guys believe that? Any questions on this part so far? Excellent. Let's talk about how to solve, well, Let's not talk about how to solve it yet. Let's talk about some useful uh, linear programs. So I mentioned earlier a lot of problems can be phrased as uh, linear programs. So let's just do a few examples. Uh, recall the knapsack problem. Knapsack, you're trying to, you have a set of items, uh, vi and wi, they have weight and value, and you're trying to steal, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to choose some uh, subset of the items such that uh, the sum of the weights of the items of S is less than or equal to some weight, and then you're trying to maximize 
uh, the amount you can steal as the sum of vi, right? This is knapsack. That's the search problem of knapsack. But actually, if you think about it, that's just everything in that equation is linear. So you can write uh, a linear program for knapsack. Um, what does it look like? Your objective function is going to be, uh, you're trying to maximize the sum of vi uh, xi uh, subject to just one constraint, which is that the sum of wi xi is a less than or equal to some large w. Um, each xi is between 0 and 1. And each xi is an integer. It's a whole number. It's not a real decimal, right? We want not fractional knapsack. We want whole knapsack. Uh, we'll talk about that, that sentence on there, each xi is an integer, in a second. For now, convince yourself that this is, this is an LP in almost standard form for knapsack. Do we agree? Each xi corresponds to whether or not you choose item i or not. So this is an LP for knapsack. All right. Questions on if this is correct? Any questions on this? So if you have an algorithm to solve, if you have an algorithm to solve LP, uh, you have an algorithm to solve knapsack. Would you agree? So every knapsack can be solved by a general LP algorithm. Uh, this constraint down here, each x i is an integer is actually uh, extremely far more complicated than it seems. That's actually really, really, it changes the problem by a lot. This is not called an LP anymore. This is called an integer linear program, which is an ILP. ILP, the complexity in the study of ILP is far different, it turns out, than the study of I, instead than the study of LP. Here's the reason, if we go back to geometry and we consider, we have our polytope of something, you know, let's say we have something like this, okay? Um, the integer solutions may not be the ones on the extremal points of the polytope anymore. Uh, suppose I plotted the integer solutions. Near the border. Okay, something like this. Which one of those maximizes the objective function? It's a hard question, actually, because you have to compute the shortest distance from a certain point to the border, but in the slope of the direction of the objective function. Um, as we'll prove later today, integer linear programming is actually NP-complete. Uh, linear programming has nice algorithms, but maybe still expensive to run. You get to, the algorithm for linear programming, as we'll see today, is you just sort of travel along the border, maximizing the objective function. Here, unfortunately, you have to basically guess and check. You have to try a bunch of things out. And unfortunately, that's going to be NP-complete. It should be believable that ILP is NP-complete. Why? We just reduced from knapsack. That's a reduction from knapsack. So we just, that's the same thing. It's at least NP-hard. Um, ILP, a uh, very different beast. We'll talk about it later. Um, consider the max flow min cut uh, examples. So recall what you what you have in max flow min cut. You have a flow network, and you want to have the fact that for each uh, edge you choose a capacity such that f of u comma v, uh, these are all greater than or equal to zero, and this is less than or equal to some capacity c u v, right? And you want to maximize the flow uh, outgoing of s, and you also have that the the, the the fact that the flow is conserved. So like whatever's going into a node must equal the flow coming out of the node. So say two, three, four, we must have, you know, five, uh, four, something like this, right? Whatever goes in must come out. Oh, sorry, right? So there's several constraints in what a flow, an, a valid solution to a flow network is, but you can actually phrase them all as a linear program. Uh, what, the, what would our objective function be? Uh, 
That would be one way to do it, but I'll phrase it, in fact, as the flow outgoing of the source. It's the same thing. Objective function is you want to maximize the sum of the flow uh, for all v in v of f of s comma v. So the sum of the outgoing uh, flow from s. Where, again, s, uh, f u v is outgoing from u and incoming to v, right? So we're maximizing the outgoing flow of s. Uh, notice also that we just conveniently defined that the flow networks don't have any incoming flows to S, but if we did define that, that would actually be okay, because then you would just subtract the flow that's incoming to S here. So you maximize the outgoing flow of S. Um, next, you have a constraint for all edges. You add constraints. Uh, zero is less than equal to F of U comma V, which is less than equal to C of U comma V. Right? This is actually three constraints, if you think about it. We're going to have uh, f of uv is greater than or equal to 0, c of uv is greater than or equal to f of uv, and then c of uv is greater than or equal to 0. So you could perhaps put this into standard form and you could separate that out. I believe that you could do that, but certainly that simulates the flow and capacity relationship. Now we just need to simulate the conservation of flow as a, a set of constraints, and we'll do that as saying that the sum of the flows for v and v uh, from f to v comma u must equal the sum of the flows v and v of f of uv. The sum of the incoming must equal the sum of the outcoming, right? Now, uh, that doesn't look like a linear inequality. That doesn't look like a linear inequality at all. In fact, that's a linear equality. But we can fix that. How would we try to fix that, maybe? Everything must be phrased as a linear inequality so that when you plot it on a polytope, you get, it, if you think in just two dimensions, a line splits the plane in half, the infinite plane in half, and you get to choose half of it. But if you have an equality, that's simply a line. How would we put an equality into standard form, which is that it's a linear inequality? Here's what you would do is, this is actually two inequalities, an inequality, you would subtract it from the other side, and then you would have a sum minus a sum is equal to zero. Right. So what you would do, and then in something is like this, if, if x is less than or equal to 2 and x is greater than or equal to 2, then you have uh, two constraints there. Right. Those are two inequalities, but any solution to it must just be the equality. So perhaps you could believe me and just take uh, two seconds to do it, transform this into our standard form. Again, standard form is a very technical formal definition. It's the uh, subject to ax less than or equal to b. Right. So that's when you, if you were to, the, the algorithms assume that what your input is given is in standard form, so they can do all their cool linear algebra things on it. And if you show up with a constraint like this, it's not going to be able to, you know, the algorithm's not going to run. You first have to convert it to standard form. Right. Any questions on the flow example? Do we believe that any solution to this LP uh, must, in fact, be the maximum flow? Every max flow has uh, an LP. So if you can solve LP, an algorithm to solve LP will, in fact, solve, L, uh, solve the max flow problem as well. Um, one final thing is you recall the max flow min cut theorem, right? Uh, maximizing one thing was sub meant minimizing something else. And if LP simulates max flow, it should also simulate min cut. We'll generalize the max flow min cut theorem tomorrow to, not tomorrow, but next class, to something called duality. There's, an, a, there's a duality theorem for LP. Every linear program has what's called a dual program, an evil twin, which is you're minimizing that solution is the same as maximizing this solution. So we have a, we'll, we'll generalize the maximal min cut theorem to any linear program as well. So any questions on this one? This, this LP, we convinced it's true. Okay, I have one hard one uh, left. And is that, in fact, you can, these are, knapsack and max flow appear to be two challenging problems, but you can actually do easy problems with LP as well, right? P is a subset of NP, in fact, so if you can do NP, you can do P for free. Um, we can compute shortest paths with max flow. We can put Bellman Ford as an LP.
So we want the shortest uh, in G. We want the shortest the shortest uh, st path. Uh, let we want variable dv to be shortest path uh, s uh, v path. So that's just what we'll name our variables. And then the shortest paths are going to be functions of the other shortest paths. Importantly here, the simulation works because when you take two paths and you compose them, you just sum them. And that's just a linear operation. So you can simulate shortest path problems with linear programming. Um, what do we want to maximize? We want to maximize uh, what? Just the way the problem is defined. If we want to find the shortest ST path. Oh, I see. We haven't talked about why this is a max problem yet. Uh, we want to maximize DT, which is the shortest path. DT is supposed to be the shortest path from S to T. Why that's a max and not a min, we'll talk about in half a second. But we want to look at the variable DT. Do you agree? That's the shortest path from S to T. Um, subject to uh, the following constraints, which is DV is less than equal to uh, DU plus the weight of edge U comma V. Uh, for all uh, u comma v in e, right? So for every edge, you'll add a constraint that the shortest path from s to v must be less than equal the shortest path from s to u plus the weight from u to v. Why does this work again, right? If you have a path to this is dv and this is du and this is uh, weight of u comma v. The shortest path to dv can either, is either dv or through du for all u, right? That's the shortest path uh, constraint. That's exactly uh, the hook that Bellman Ford uses for the correctness of its algorithm, right? Oh, and uh, ds, we have one more constraint, ds is equal to zero. Now, why is it the case that this is a maximization and not a minimization problem? Like everyone, I, I explain this I think every year, and it, it always tricks people up. Basically, this linear program does have, you can put, the only examples of linear programs we've seen have been maximization problems. But you can put a minimization there, no problem. You can minimize with respect to an objective function. It's the same as maximizing with respect to the negative of the objective function, right? So why is this a maximization, not a minimization? The answer is that if it was a minimization, this LP has the smallest answer. What is that answer? It's just dt is equal to zero, right? Just set dt to zero. So it, that satisfies all the constraints, because these are all going to be positive numbers. So you set dt to 0, and that's a solution. That's the minimal solution, in fact. The shortest path can't be less than or equal to 0. Um, but that's not a path in the graph. There's not a path in the graph from s to t of length 0. So in fact, the constraints eliminate all longer paths, and then the only valid solution that corresponds to the path is the maximal length uh, that could dt could take on, right? Once you apply the constraints, you'll get the fact that uh, dt is going to actually be equal to the min of y the min u, where uv uh, is an element of e of uh, du plus weight of u comma t, right? If that's true, all the smaller solutions aren't real solutions, so the maximal solution is the only solution that does correspond to an actual path in the graph. Okay? I explain this every year, most people don't understand it after staring at it for several minutes. But this, I promise you, is a maximization problem and not a minimization problem. Any questions on these three examples, on this example specifically? Would you agree that this, this does simulate the shortest path problem through linear constraints? All right, so we see that linear programming is really diverse. It's got a lot of things going for it. It's got the fact that uh, you can do shortest path problem, you can do max flow problems, you can do knapsack problems, you can do many problems are just LPs. So many problems are LPs. All the graph algorithms will, will, could be done as LPs. And again, there's an interpretation of this geomet geometrically. This is a shortest path problem. You create a convex polytope, and then you find the maximal point on that convex polytope in n dimensions. 
Um, so let's actually talk about an algorithm to solve LP rather than just LP uh, abstractly. It's called the simplex algorithm. It's called the simplex algorithm because the simplex is a n-dimensional convex polyfill. That's just like the name of the thing, right? So first let me uh, do some n-dimensional stuff. Let's suppose we had a, uh, like this. Okay. Suppose we had an n-dimensional convex polytope. Picture that if you have the ability, you can take a cube. Can you guys picture a cube and you can rotate the cube in your mind, right? So take the cube and take the gem. The, uh, this is a three-dimensional version, but I'm drawing it on a two-dimensional board, so there's going to be some difficulty involved here. But this is an intersection of several linear inequalities. The inequalities are of three variables. It's going to be things like x1 plus 2x2 plus... 6x3 is less than or equal to 100 or something like this, right? That's going to denote, because it's of three variables, it doesn't denote a line in the plane that partitions to space. Uh, it denotes a plane in three dimensions which partitions three space, right? You take the intersection, you just generalize that picture, that picture, you, you, you take the intersections of all these planes, you get a gem looking thing. It's a convex polytope rather than a convex polygon, but the convexity property still holds. And we still get the part that, you know, a point exists maximally on the polytope, right? So we're looking for a solution on the polytope. And here's how the simplex algorithm basically works. Uh, we'll do the simplex algorithm in detail, like how a computer would do it uh, next time. But let's just give the intuition. You begin at the corner. Uh, y is zero, 0, a corner on every polytope, because if you assume that the uh, linear program is in standard form, at each xi is less than, is greater than or equal to zero. So x1, x equals x2 equals x3 equals zero is in fact a corner. It's a right angle corner of the polytope. Um, while true, uh, if any corner, say, V is equal to zero comma zero. If any corner uh, V prime uh, neighbor of uh, V is more optimal, uh, V prime is equal to V, excuse me, V equals V prime, else break, return V. This is a high level uh, geometric uh, interpretation of what the simplex algorithm does. How you actually implement this, we'll talk about later. But let's just talk about what the simplex algorithm looks like if you visualize it. You're going to start at a corner point in the simplex algorithm. You start, let's say, at this point. Okay. You look at your neighbors and you just check if any of them are more optimal. By more optimal, it just means does that point plugged into the objective function, is it greater than if you plug your current point to the objective function? So if it's yes, then you're going to say V takes on V prime. Okay? If you say, oh, this is more optimal, more optimal, more optimal, more optimal, um, more optimal, more optimal, something like this. The best way to think about the simplex algorithm is you are doing a walk on the perimeter of a convex polytope. You're taking a walk along the border. If we know that the solution is one of the points, one of the fantastic things about the simplex algorithm is that the fact that when you have a region like this, any region within, any, any point within the feasible region is a solution. But the fact that the maximal solution is on the border, we get a fantastic thing. There's infinitely many solutions to this problem, right? But there's only finitely many points on the outside of the convex polytope. So although a linear program can be phrased in such a way that there's infinitely many solutions, the problem, the example we did of the boss, like, uh, you know, having to sell items x1 and x2 means those are integers. But uh, it may be true that they are real numbers. So they could be, you could have an optimal solution at square root of 2 or something weird, you know? Uh, but that doesn't matter because there's only finitely many points on the outskirts of the polytope. So the simplex algorithm 
the be one of the great things, there's many beautiful parts about this algorithm. One of the great parts is that the, there's, you only have to check finitely many solutions to find your maximal. Yes? Fantastic question. Convexity. So this is a greedy algorithm. You're not even choosing the optimal one of your neighbors. You're just choosing if there is one more of your neighbors, okay? Let's say you're here and it looks like this. Let's say you're looking at it from the top, okay? You have, you're at some point in n dimensions, you have four neighbors, okay? You just choose if one of them is greater towards the objective function. You don't even have to choose the greatest one towards the objective function. Why? Because let's say the objective function tells you to go that way, and you don't check this one, you check this one first. But later on, it'll, it'll, that, there'll be an edge that leads you towards the objective function that way anyway. So in some sense, the simplest algorithm is a very simple, greedy algorithm to just, that just says, I'm just going to wander on the surface, of the, not even on the surface of the polytope, the edges of the polytope. And if I know that that direction leads me to maximize the objective function, I'll walk that way, along that path. Why does that guarantee there's a solution that way? It's because the objective function is convex. You won't get into a deadlock I issue. Yes? So let's do your example. Let's say we have a cube. Okay. Let's say we we have a we have a maximal solution at this corner, and let's say that there is a large number at this corner. Okay. This corner. In the middle. Like on the face. Here. All right, let me, is that better? Three dimensions? Okay. That one. Okay. Ah, ah, great, great point. Let's say this is like one, let's say this is negative one, negative one, negative one, if you plug into the objection function, and then this point is two. That's not convex. QED. Why? Let's plot this. Let's just do the two-dimensional version. What would that look like two-dimensionally? It would look like you have... Uh, a high point here, and then a, something like this. So if you're at this, let's say you're trying to maximize, let's even suppose the shape looks like that. You're trying to, this is not the convex polytope, this is with respect to the objective function. You're here, you're trying to maximize yourself. You look to the left, oh, it's, you're decreasing. You look to the right, oh, you're decreasing. You're at a global, you're at a global maxima you don't realize that you're, excuse me, you're at the local maxima, you don't realize you're at a global maxima, which would be here or here. But that's not convex. The objective function notably is linear, which guarantees this. Not even the shape of the object. The shape of the object helps with that, but the fact that the objective function is linear means you will not, I pinky promise you'll never have something like that. Think about gravity. If you walk somewhere, gravity doesn't get stronger, doesn't, if you walk towards something, gravity doesn't pull you the opposite direction, and then if you keep walking past it, it starts pulling you in that direction again as well. Right? Think of it as a vector field that is linear. Right? If you remember from diff differential equations, you have like complicated vector fields. You draw a bunch of arrows in a two-dimensional plane. There's spirals and weird things going on. But if it's a linear, if you have a linear vector field, I mean, it's just you're just being pulled by gravity in one direction. I pinky, pinky promise by convexity that won't happen. You can prove that won't happen, but I'm hoping that just today we have a high level. To, we can just use things we learned in high school geometry and believe that to be true. Great point to make, though. I, 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 does, do you guys agree with that? That such a convex point won't happen? All right. Um, second thing is, this is not uh, a way that the algorithm is implemented. There's lots of details that the way the algorithm is implemented. How does the algorithm know what the neighbors are? It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't say, thank you for this nice graphic of a polytope. Let me just walk along it now in Blender. That's not how it works. What basically what happens is it chooses a point and then we talked about a point being the intersection of several lines or planes, and that point also being, in, in, three, in two space, a point is the intersection of two lines. In three space, two planes intersect in a line. Three planes must intersect in a point if they all have different slopes, right? So a point in three space is the intersection of three constraints. So basically, the way the algorithm is actually going to work, and we'll see this next time, is it chooses several constraints, and it chooses to keep those tight, and it chooses to relax several other constraints and increase towards the objective function. So what will happen is it will uh, say, I'm going to let go of this constraint, and I'm going to make this constraint tight. 
So I'm going to choose x, and x1 and x2 and x3 so that this constraint is not less than or equals to, but exactly equals to, and I'm going to ignore the constraint that I left behind. And as you do so, you'll choose a set of constraints which you, uh, which you will choose to be tight, and eventually the set of constraints you choose to be tight is, will be the point of the convex polyfill that you maximize. Right? Basically, in a geometric interpretation of what that is, it's just repeatedly changing the coordinate basis. It's going to be repeatedly rotate the object so that 0 comma 0 is now this point that you're currently at until the max is at 0 comma 0, right? Uh, that's how the simplex algorithm works at a high level. It's got a great geometric understanding. Implementing it with linear algebra is going to be a challenge. We'll do that next time. Any questions on this one so far? All right, let's do a quick example of uh, running the simplex algorithm, quote unquote. We're not going to really run the simplex algorithm, but we're going to run the simplex algorithm on a um, linear program. So suppose we have the following linear program. Um, we have, we want to maximize 2x1 plus 5x2, subject to the following constraints. Uh, 2x1 minus x2, less than or equal to 4. x1 plus x2, plus 2x2, is less than or equal to 9. Minus x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 3. And then x1, x2, x1 is greater than or equal to 0. x2 is greater than or equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is not run the simplex algorithm as we'll see it tomorrow. I'm simply going to uh, traverse the, toly, the polytope on the board for this specific linear program, plugging and chugging into the objective function, which is not what the simplex algorithm does. But we can still view the execution of the simplex algorithm as a traversal on the polytope. X1 and X2 are greater than or equal to zero, means we're here. Uh, we're going to have, let's say, Uh, we're going to have a line like this, and then we're going to have a line from 2 to 3 comma 2, which is like there. And then we'll have a line from 4 comma 1 to 3 comma 3. Something like that. So this is supposed to be uh, 0 comma 3. This is supposed to be uh, 1 comma 4. Just where these, these planes intersect. This is supposed to be 2 comma 0. This is supposed to be approximately 3.4, uh, 2.8, right? Something like this. OK, so we're going to start at 0 comma 0 here. And this is, of course, a 0 comma 0. So if we, we start here at 0 comma 0, um, and we have, uh, if we plug 0 comma 0 into the objective function, uh, what are we going to get? We're going to get, uh, so we have 2x1 plus 5x2 as part of our objective function. Uh, 2, 0 plus 5 times 0 is equal to 0. So we currently have, we have no objective function value. We have 0, right? Let's choose a point. Now, here's the great part about the simplex. It doesn't say take the maximum of my neighbors. It just says take a neighbor. Because we know that we'll eventually, by convexity, lead to the maximal anyway. We may take a longer route, but we are guaranteed to reach the maximum because there's only a lo it's local convexity. So let's just choose 0, 3. Now, if I plug in 0, 3 to that, what am I going to get? I'm going to get 